I'm looking forward to this one. This is a group of colleagues from VITS who are going to talk to us about how they've used discussion boards to help students learn to navigate Ch chat GPT. And I was very interested in what you said in your abstract about AI providing a way for social learning. So I'm very interested in hearing the presentation. Um, could I hand straight over to you, Laura? Great, Enid will be um, okay. staring uh, at OK, thank you very much. I mean, to introduce myself, you've done that for me. I'm Enid from Psychology, and I'm presenting this together with Laura Dyson and Roshni Pillay. Roshni said she might join. Laura, do you want to put your camera on and just say how's it to people? Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Caught you out, checking that you brushed your hair. <laughs> OK, um, so really just to put you in the picture before we start, you know, between Laura, myself and Roshni, our sort of common goal in higher education, or as we see it, is to develop student skills, knowledge and competencies so that eventually they can go out into the big wide world, get a job and just navigate the worlds that they find themselves in. So we great believers and, you know, especially having Laura on our team with all of her expertise that you know, is this idea that our pedagogic strategies have to be intentional, they've got to be purpose driven and they've got to be meaningfully directed. They can't just like this is the latest trend. This is the way we're going to, to be quite mindful about what we're doing and what we're teaching and what skills we want in um, in our teaching is very important to us. You know, and, and if we reflect back on you know March 2020 when suddenly the COVID crisis came along and just threw everything that we were used to into disarray you know um and in the the, the interest of social distancing we had to sort of totally do a about flip and rethink our, our student support uh, strategies it was that reaction of shock horror oh now what and and, and I think that our initial reaction to AI was almost the same. Oh, oh we, you know, we get student essays and now they're going to be written by a com Oh, but the more we sit back and think of it and the more I've listened uh, during this conference, the more confidence, you know, and, and to use AI. And I think it's come up over and over again that AI is an assistant. AI is there to take over the mundane, to, uh, free us up to do the stuff and i think the comment i like best was from our morning speaker where she said you know um ai can't teach bedside manner for a doctor and coming from humanities this is one of the you know the really important skills for for our students who are going to be teachers and psychologists and social workers so you know have to react on a very human way with their patients but i think you know, if, if I go back to, you know, coping with online learning, I mean, we co we coped with it. We benefited from a very positive learning curve. Um, but we did discover there that as much as, you know, you could put up asynchronous lectures, that did not make an educator. And so, you know, in the same breath, AI does not make a university graduate. Otherwise, the computer could just print out the degrees and we could all go home. So, as I said, we, we can free up our time by outsourcing to AI for what it does well, and we can focus on the human skill stuff that I say is so important for our um, particular disciplines. So, I, I mean, just before I move on to the actual presentation, just to share our lockdown learning curve and, and what really motivated our, you know, raw, raw discussion board attitude. So when we moved to uh, online learning, the online knowledge transfer was probably the easiest thing to con uh, accommodate. You know, and that's AI, why AI generated essays, I think have become such a buzzword. Uh, we just put up pre-recorded lessons, asynchronous um, consumption of students with little questions interspersed to make sure that you know, they couldn't move forward until they'd shown they'd understood that bit. We had weekly synchronous sessions, which uh, ensured the continuous lecturer present. But 
what we did find that possibly because of um, data consumption or connectivity issues, the student prim uh, presence was often limited to just the privileged few. And obviously for our disciplines, this is incredibly important. Um, and to increase student presence, the connectivity between students to foster collegiality, uh, we felt as educators that we needed to incorporate a positive step in this. So we turned to the discussion boards and our objective of this discussion boards was to really um, engage and challenge students and elicit their voice. Um, you know, we view discussion forums as a way to extend and I deliberately use the word extend extend knowledge, um, support the, the student, um, support collaborative and peer learning. You know, basically everything we see as having a role and that we, we really see the well-rounded graduate as leaving our institution with a full bouquet of attributes. Um, and, men, and, and each one of these we see as being developed in a different manner and in a manner that one can't be sacrificed for another. And, and so this was sort of our basic background. In our experience with discussion boards, we felt that it offered students uh, various affordances, both during and subsequent to COVID-19. We believe that the flexibility of the medium extended period, um, learning periods without the constraints of time and place. Um, and we, we felt this was an important consideration, not only for the part-time mature bits plus students who are juggling academia with commitments to family and work, but also where our students study and live um, in environments that you know are far apart. And you know, we do not have a great transport system. We do have serious safety issues after daylight hours. So we can't extend our tutorial periods or our library sessions past a certain time. So what we found was that in addition to providing an opportunity for collaborative learning, the medium was able to promote the development of some critical intellectual dialogue and public good discourse, you know, which is particularly important in these students in the helping professions. So, you know, what were we looking at when we were, you know, trying to remediate the, the consequences of COVID in the very beginning. You know, for, as I say, for the psychology student engaging in academic discourse was an important skill that we felt was lacking in online learning. Um, we did note that because of the device being used or the other mentioned uh, reasons from earlier, students logged onto the synchronous interactions without microphone facilities. And I might just as well have Put up a posted pre-recorded recording. And the other thing that is, I think, even more important, and this is where, you know, I feel that we have to supplement AI a lot, was, you know, we're looking at a decolonized syllabus. We're looking at the information into to AI coming very much from our weird countries, from our global north. And, you know, we're trying to move away from that level of understanding. So, you know, for a decolonized syllabus, it was extremely important for us to include the diversity of the student community and to engage with perspectives that arise from different cultures and would enhance the understanding of broader traditional values and beliefs. And, you know, as I previously mentioned, we found in live lectures, there's generally a handful of privileged few who dominate the discussions and it's difficult to engage the more reticent student. However, with the online, I don't know whether this was um, a reflection of the anonymity of discussion boards and going to the electronic medium or whether, um, you know, or what it was, but the, the voice of our a much broader range of students started coming through and people were 
sharing quite sort of personal insights and developing this broader understanding of our community and the diversity of our community almost without hesitation and as i say i think the anonymity is one thing but i think the other thing was in that sort of non-immediate environment our second language learners have time to sit back and think about how they're typing very often if they've got to think about it in words on the moment they become very shy to express themselves and so you know i i, I really you know see this as, as being a big benefit to uh, using our discussion boards so while we uh, initially looked at the discussion board as a means to promote dialogical engagement and allow the students to articulate debate opinions create share synthesize knowledge uh, the more we use the platform and shared ideas between our disciplines, the more we realize the potential for a broader application in a range of activities. And, you know, some of these, um, you know, some of these areas will, that we get assistance from AI will, will definitely um, free up a lot of our time, you know, for these more important activities. Okay, so, you know, I, did, I have noticed over the past day and a half, there's been numerous references to assessment. And, you know, I want to mention that here, you know, that you, many of the speakers have spoken about AI as being a complementary source, but with particular reference, to uh, there's been a lot of talk of AI generated essays and where does this lead us with assessment, so on and so forth. But with particular relevance to this, you know, we really believe that a well designed discussion board can either manipulate the task to focus on the student's voice and in doing so render AI quite a resilient form or AI resilient form of assessment um, and make it very relevant to the student, relevant to our culture, relevant to our situation. However, alternatively, you can set up collaborative learning tasks that lead students on a journey of discovery relative to best practice in the use of AI to enhance and benefit their learning. So, you know, having students share their experiences with AI assists. I mean, it's a form of mediated learning. And as a group, the students are able to critically analyze and develop their skills, not only to improve their access to AI, but also using it as a means to enhance general critical thinking, um, analysis and questioning skills. You know, if they are going to generate an essay, they they have to pose the correct question. And that is, I mean, throughout academia, it's not so much the knowledge that, you know, do you know the answer? It's do you know the question to ask? And I think the discussion board and discussing, you know, uh, letting students develop students in this regard um, is going to come up with tremendous benefits. Okay, so um, to just, and, and this was mentioned by one of the presenters in stream one, or no, when the student group was presenting before we split into streams. And this is an example of what we've done, sort of using AI. Um, I, I was teaching the first year biological psychology class, and this is a class that many of the students, you know, particularly those who didn't have life sciences in high school, find quite intimidating. And what we did was we used an AI generated essay to try and combat the typical procrastination that we see in students, not knowing where to start. And as I say, especially in this topic that sort of scares them a little bit. So we posted the basic essay topic to chat GPT and we elicited what was actually a pretty crummy essay um, and students were given the essay marking rubric that we intended to use on their own essays. And we asked them to evaluate the essay. What we wanted them to do, number one, was to get started on their essay writing and number two, think quite critically about 
what they were going to do, how they were going to approach this topic. And I must say, some of them pretty mean markers. A lot of them failed the essay. And then, um, you know, what they were asked to do after that was reevaluate the the way we had put it to um, chat GPT and ask the, an improved question and then post the question and the response that they got to the discussion board so that they could share this with their peers um, and you know discuss what were the original shortcomings of the essay did the reformulated question result in a better essay were the points that were then lost in the reformulated essay and to have this you know with because normally we have groups of 20 or 30 students participating in each conversation um, it really honed their skills um, you know in, in, in thinking about what they had to do, what they had to include, the planning of their own essays. And much to my surprise, their own essays didn't reflect AI. They Their essays were very much their own. And I think the final AI one was probably better than the one I got from the students, but that's beside the point. They can learn from it. And the other thing that we asked them to do was to ask AI to generate a reference list. You know, a lot of people have been talking about, oh, you could get rubbish from AI. You know, it's, um, AI generated stuff is based on all kinds of weird and wonderful things. So we got we um, generated a reference list. They had to comment on the quality of these references. This was really my manipulation to um, get. Um, get the students to, I think Laura's either telling me she wants to say something or she's telling me that I must hurry up and speak finished. Um, you you've got a few more minutes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Minutes. I'll talk quick. Um, so th they had to evaluate these, say what was good, say what was bad, and then generate their own what three uh, readings that they thought, thought was great. So as we've moved forward with this chat GPT thing, you know, we're looking at the possibility of engaging AI as an active participant in the discussions, you know, a virtual peer um, that may prove to uh, generate thought provoking questions, add additional insights, encourage um, students to read further, because the literature seems to be quite mixed in whether they feel it's beneficial to have a lot of lecturer input or not. So you know, this might be a way around this. Despite this, we, we still note that while ChatGPT is, is a good student learning tool, it doesn't replace the human instructors entirely. It's complementary, supportive, assisting. It enhances the learning experience, but doesn't replace what we've got. So, you know, with a quick reference, I think I've talked sufficiently about what we've done in psychology, but whoops, that went too quickly. Um, but just to mention the implementation of a discussion board within social work, they took the discussion board as um, part of a broader project. And what they did was it was they chose, well, for this demonstration, it's the module that I've chosen was a social work module, which um, it was a, a semester long writing intensive course that accumulates in a 25 page written report that based on uh, reflections of the theory of small group experiences. The students do get a double lecture every week where they work in groups and collaborate, but they had to report back on this. They had to keep notes of this. Um, the, the task itself posting you know doing this and posting their progress um onto the discussion boards was 50 percent of the mark the remaining mark was a group project um a, a, a reflection diary and i think a reflection diary is something very important you know it's a skill that i think one of the skills that i think we can't rely on ai to do. I think it's one of the skills we have to possibly develop even further in our students so they can be quite reflective of the uh, information that they're getting from AI. 
Uh, I say it included the discussion boards. They had 10 posts that they had to make over the course. They and then even individual students had to choose the best five of these. And this is just an example of the type of post that came. And if you read through this, then you have to wonder if in our specific South African situation, that um, you know when the, the the big hospitals moved all of their HIV patients out to the local clinics, whether they whether AI would have thought to move beyond moving them to the closest clinic and offer them a clinic in the next village so that they wouldn't be seen by the neighbours and the and the stigma, you know, that is then associated. So basically, you know, using the discussion boards. Our conclusion was that we want to encourage articulation, reflection and social negotiation. The question itself must evoke different opinions. It must be relevant to the students. It must be relevant to the uh, syllabus. There must be no right and wrong answers. We must instruct students to respect the opinions of others, but also feel free to engage in the discourse um, and accept that somebody else may want to argue the point, um, but in a very respectful manner. So, as I say, we use smaller groups in this, which would depend on the, the particular topic that we were using. We do find that um, the, that opinions very quickly saturate, so we change our question on the discussion board once every two weeks. We feel that gives them enough time to participate and um, but not long enough to get bored with it and stop participating, you know. Um, so what we what we found for, and and unfortunately this is just it's just an example of how we evaluate by this skill. We have found that to involve students in the learning process, it's often not the pursuit of knowledge that motivates, but rather the quantifiable achievement. We learned that all discussion boards have to have a mark attached. In addition, um, student time planning is frequently not very good and dominated by the due date, not the available date. And so we have to sort of instruct them that the important date on a discussion board is the opening, not the closing date. And we generally use an analogy of going to a party. You get to the party, you start chatting to people, you don't wait till you're walking to your car to go home. So this is all stressed. And to, to reinforce it, we actually have a mark for timely and evenly distributed contributions in the discussion, which we felt is like really important, um, you know, to, to uh, make it. Uh, we, we tell them that this is respect for their peers. Their peers can't join a conversation if there's nobody to talk to. So, you know, all of those sort of social skills come through quite a lot. Um, you know, and whilst we allow them to post the links to a journal, a TED talk, a YouTube video, quote from popular media, or even a comic strip, we keep telling them we want to hear their voice. They must say why they chose to post it, why they felt it was relevant and important, what they learned from it, what questions it evoked. You know, and again, we sort of use the analogy of the party and tell them they don't want to speak to the long winded monologue from the windbag of the party. They want to interact with somebody who's more engaging and interesting. And, and, and you know, this is the way, um, you know, we try and put it through. And we do find the student voice and personality being reflected in the um, in the discussion. So, you know, basically with, we felt that we were able to elicit the student's voice and um, that they were able to project their individual experiences, whether it be in their workplace uh, placement, um, within their practicals, how they manage to interact within other societies. Um, we were able to uh, foster a social presence that people began to understand each other, engage with each other beyond the discussion boards. Um, we, we saw it as helping in the acceptance of diversity. We saw some critical engagement. We felt that we were developing a lot of skills within the students. And when it comes to, you know, assessment, we found it to be quite AI resistant. 
Oh, Laura, how was that? That was great. And I just want to make one point, but we'd really love to hear some of your input. And that is that there's been a lot of talk um, over the last day or two about how important it is to assess the product and the process of learning, particularly as a way of addressing some of the dangers of AI. Um, I also want to come back to a point that um, Tony made right at the beginning about how we use, we can use AI in the discussion boards. I mean, we almost use it as a tool, but I think it can be a presence. But I think that the significant thing in both social work and psychology, and in some cases in education, is 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 that transparency that was spoken about today of of the criteria. The ideal scenario would be to, for students to actually engage with the criteria and, and 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 negotiate the criteria but I think what's really important is that students know what we're looking for that it's about clarity it's about insightful observation that it's evidence of meta learning honesty self-awareness evidence of critical thinking as Ian had said um, and and all of those things are emphasized and reinforced continually so thanks very much and would would we would you know we we're taking this further this project this is just the beginning but I think what what Enid and Roshni have done is a fantastic um, kind of project in discussion boards, which they've incorporated and integrated as part of their courses in a very meaningful and learning oriented way. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Enid and Laura. Are there any questions from the from the room? And just on Nikki's point about reflexivity um, in the chat, I, th I think um, Nikki, you know, Roshni and I were talking about this a lot also with Nora Lee, um, that, that it's, reflexivity is not something that happens, you know, naturally or automatically. It has to be cultivated. And, you know, so there was quite a bit of training. I don't know if you want to talk about that, Enid, but it's certainly something that that has has developed over time. It's it's not something that's you know assumed that students can do. And they also the modeling is very important. And maybe that's where AI can come in, uh, Dominique, is um is is as a model of of how to engage in these um in discussion boards. I was going to ask you, Laura, did you use a code of conduct for students? Um, yes, it's... if I can refer to Ina, definitely. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, we make it very clear. We chat about it in class, you know, what what is respectful, you know, um, and, and I, as much as I don't try and uh, participate in the, the discussion board too much, you always keep on monitoring on it. And I must say they're extremely respectful of each other. We haven't had any sort of, you know, even when we choose quite um, sort of sensitive topics, we had one on euthanasia. They were very respectful of other opinions. That is so, yes, we make it quite clear that, you know, the disrespectful behaviour won't be tolerated. And I think possibly for us more than in other disciplines, it's maybe easier because you know, we we are the helping professions. We do spend a lot of time working on empathy and understanding that is all part of their courses. So I think that they're quite sensitive in that way. Right. I think it is important to have a code of conduct if you're going to moderate a discussion, you know, so a student knows why you may edit a post if it's if they post something disrespectful. Um, OK, Tony, no taken. I see Antoinette has yeah. a hand up. Tony? I see Antoinette has a hand up. <laughs> yes, and it's, I'm known as Tony. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to comment. Number one, I think I like the way you introduced yourselves, like giving us a background of where you're coming from and why you had to do this, why you had to go this way. Uh, as a student, it's very daunting when you are in a diverse environment uh, because there's always that fear of, being seen as foolish or stupid. So I think I, I like Dominic's question of asking, did you establish first, did you speak about the code of conduct online? Because there are those students who can always make others feel inferior, you know. I mean, if you come from a, from a rural family or uh, like from Eastern Cape, for instance, and you're not always like familiar with writing good English. So obviously you'd be afraid in this, uh, in the discussion to comment. 
but the fact that you establish all of that so that student voices can come out and without judgment. And I think that I commend you on that because that's very important for any student that I'm in a diverse uh, environment, but I can still express myself as I am, as I know myself. And I will not be judged for saying things that I'm saying. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Sorry. Thanks, yeah. Tony. Thanks, Internet. As I say, we we are quite we do talk about it a lot, but I haven't initiated a formal code of conduct, and I will definitely do that before next block starts. Um, and also, Internet, you know, so what, well, the one point that I made was when it's in class and it's spoken, the second language speaker will be reticent to speak in case they make a mistake. When it's written, they get longer time to make sure, you know, they can look up the spelling, they can grammar check it using a word thing first and then put it up. And so I think this is why we've had a lot more of the diverse, normally reticent students participating. And of course, they outnumber the lot that normally speaks. And so their voice becomes quite strong, which is, is rather nice. Okay, thank you, Enid. I think we need to wrap this session. Thank it you very much. It was very interesting, and it's nice to know that people are using discussion boards in this way. <laughs>